Jeremiah 14. I hope you guys all have a Bible with you here tonight, and uh, we're going to get into 14, possibly 15 here tonight. We'll see how we do. But it says, let's just get right into it. Verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. Judah mourns and her gates languish. They mourn for the land and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. So what we see happening here, right off the bat here in Jeremiah 14, is we see that the, the land is essentially speaking out to the nation here in the way that God has seen them, all right? Now, of course, the people here in this day, in this time, in this area, would recognize very clearly that this drought that they're experiencing, this dryness that they're encountering, is not just by coincidence, it's not by some accident, this is not, you know, some just happenstance where they're sitting there going, boy, it hasn't rained in a long time here, gee, this is kind of weird. They're recognizing this very clearly to be an act of God here, they would understand very clearly that this is God that is doing that. You see, the problem with this nation here is that they have turned away from God. The book of Jeremiah is really Jeremiah coming to his people to declare to them that judgment is coming because they've turned away from the Lord. So here we see the land now. It's dry, it's desolate, it's barren. It's really reflecting their spiritual state before God. This is the way that God has seen them. They're dry, they're desolate, and they're encountering this now within their own land. And they recognize very clearly that this would be a work of the Lord. It was part of the covenant curses according to Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy 11, verse 10. Uh, verse 10. We'll just read a couple verses here. For the, for the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden, but the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from the rain of heaven. A land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. It's comparing it to the land of Egypt when they came out. Egypt had great natural irrigation that was all through the land, you know, the Nile River, bringing water in and stuff. And so they could rely upon their crops growing very reliably, you know. They weren't relying upon the rain from heaven. God says... This land that you're coming into is not like the land you've come out of in Egypt. It's going to be different. You're going to be relying upon the rains from heaven, which would mean they're relying on who to provide rain? You guys in the front row, give me help here. They're relying on God to bring the rain from heaven. They would understand very clearly this is going to be God that's got to provide for them. So God is saying it's not like that land. He goes on to say there in verse 13 of Deuteronomy 11, And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil, and I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. And he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So the people knew full well here, all right? Like I'm saying, they knew full well that their own actions have brought this upon themselves, that this, this dryness that they're experiencing is a result of their own waywardness, just like God had told them many years ago in Deuteronomy, listen, when you come into the land, walk in obedience, walk in faithfulness, and if you do, oh, man, you're going to have rain provided for you right when you need it. It's going to grow your crops. You're going to be filled and fed. It's going to be good. All right? This wasn't, you know, Vancouver weather over in this day where, I mean, it's like, Lord, can you hold back the rain a little bit, you know? Uh, in this day, they're like, Lord, bring the rain. We need it to grow our, our crops. We need this water. They relied upon it. God says, I'm going to do that. So you walk in obedience. You will be taken care of, you see. And a result of their waywardness was that they became dry. Understand this here, guys. I think that the, the picture is very fitting because it's the same way when we find ourselves in a dry period of our lives. We may wonder, perhaps, what external circumstances are causing us. What is going on that's causing me to be so dry? Maybe it's my neighbor next to me. Oh, maybe it's, 
you know, this schoolwork I have to do that's just really annoying me. And it's causing me just to be really dry and desolate. I'm just really missing it, you know. No, it's not an external circumstance. These people were not looking outwardly. They were needing to look inwardly as with us. When we are experiencing dryness in our lives, perhaps we're experiencing, and I'm speaking spiritually, a dryness in our walk with the Lord, we can't look externally and try to point the finger. We need to look internally and say, why am I this way? Lord, have I gotten away from you? Have I begun to drift in my relationship with you? Have I allowed compromise in or waned in my devotions with you, Lord? What is it that's causing me to feel and experience this dryness and desolation in my life? Well, we understand that without the Lord, there's going to be no life, no vibrancy. You know, it's what the people were told even back in Jeremiah chapter, chapter 2, when the Lord says, for my people have committed two evils, all right? They've forsaken me, notice this, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn themselves cisterns, and they're broken cisterns that can hold no water. God was saying, I was to you, or I am to you, a fountain of living waters. You want to be fed? You want to be having your thirst quenched? Come to me. But they were rejecting him. They were turning away from him. They were turning to the cisterns, in a sense, of the world. They were relying upon faulty things to provide that quenching in their lives, to provide that help in their lives. And they were like broken cisterns, the things of the world. Understand this here, guys. There are many people. Here's the great thing about this, all right, that as we talk about thirst, it's a universal need, isn't it, right? It's something that we all, anybody ever not experienced thirst in their life before? Anybody? No? Everybody's experienced thirst. All right, you put your hand down, you're joking. Everybody's experienced thirst at one point or another. And you know what? It's probably one of the greatest cravings we can experience when you're thirsty. It's something that drives you. It's something that, like, I've got to fix this. I've got to get something down my throat here to quench this. It's a, it's a, a drive that is just insatiable, in a sense. But it's a universal need. It's something that we all experience. We all can't live without water. We need water, right? And so the people here were turning away from this fountain of living water, turning to the things of the world. But it was just like broken cisterns that could not hold any water. And the world is very deceptive. The, the enemy is very deceptive to make you think, you know what? You, you want to be fed? You want to be satisfied? Come over here. Try this out. This is really going to work for you. But in the end, it just turns out to be broken cisterns that's leaking, that's holding nothing, that we try to dip into it. And for a time, it might have a source there, but in the end, it's going to be empty and leave us ourselves dry, barren, and desolate. You know, that's why Jesus comes, and he, and he ministers to that woman at the well. Remember that woman at the well in John 4? And she's relying upon the, the broken cisterns of the world to find satisfaction. She's turning to other relationships, you see. And Jesus comes to her, and he begins to minister to her. And he says in John 4, verse 14, But whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And Jesus also says in John chapter 7, verse 37 to 38, on that last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood, out, stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I, I love that. Don't you love that? Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Not, not a little squirt gun here, just a little, you know, thing. It's like rivers of living water is going to flow out of you. You see, it's going to be satisfying. What a blessing that is. Because Jesus has come to fill us up with living water. That we no longer have to go through life feeling dry or parched or craving something, you see, it's all met and found in Jesus Christ. He is that source for us to provide that strength, to provide that satisfaction, to quench that need of thirst that we all have, you see. But the key to experiencing that overflowing life, that rivers of living waters, to be abiding in Christ and live obediently to him, that brings us back to Jeremiah. This is the problem that they're experiencing. They've gotten away, they've wandered, they've drifted, they've stopped walking in obedience to God and his word, and now they're finding themselves dry. So again, the question, have I been experiencing dryness in my life? 
Have I been encountering this barrenness? We know where the source of water is. So we know what to do, don't we? We need to return to the Lord. We need to look to Jesus. We need to cling to Him, abide in Him, and walk obediently to His Word. And when we do, we're going to find that all oh, that rivers of living water is just flowing out of our heart as well. So, notice before we move on that this drought here was affecting everyone and everything. It even says there, look at that in verse 2, the gates languish in the city. I mean, things were just starting to become decrepit, falling apart in a sense. And, and it goes on to say in verse 2, the nobles have sent their lads for water. The nobles, the, the princes, in other words, kind of the elite of the area, you know, uh, the, the wealthy perhaps, I mean, Understand that this drought is affecting everybody. They're sending their lads. They're sending their, their kids, you know, the, the little ones, the young ones, to go get water for them. And yet the kids are coming back empty-handed here. They're coming back with vessels filled in the water because there's nothing to be found. All right? This is, this is affecting everybody. And it brought great shame upon the people. And so it says there that they covered their heads. It was a sign of great grief and mourning. That's why they did that. Well, reading on in verse 4, it says, Because the ground is parched, for there was no rain in the land. The plowmen were, the plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. Yes, the deer also gave birth in the field, but left because there was no grass. And the wild donkey stood in the desolate heights. They sniffed at the wind like jackals. Their eyes failed because there was no grass. So again, right from the wealthy to the, the farmers, kind of the, the lower class in a sense. In this day, everyone now, right from the top to the bottom, everybody's experiencing the effects of this drought. And it's causing this great shame and grief. It was even affecting the animal kingdom. Do you see that, guys, right? Even the deer, it says the deer goes out into the field, gives birth, right? And the deer is one that typically, normally, would show great care for its young. But now the deer's going out, giving birth, and just leaving this little doe, the little fawn, just leaving it in the field, abandoning it, because there's no grass. There's nothing growing. There's nothing to eat. There's no water. There's nothing. So the mama deer says, you know what? That's it. There's nothing here for you, right? You know, and just leaves it, basically. And the donkey, it's saying, and the donkey was one of those animals that could really, uh, you know, continue on, be, be sustained, in a sense, um, through difficult circumstances. It was known as very tough and, and would just um, continue on. But it, too, was being forced to search out any grass that would uh, be found. You know, it's sniffing kind of in the wind, looking for trying to find any kind of moisture, any area that might find grass, and sniffing in the wind, it says here, and yet their eyes fail. They're, they're looking, and all of a sudden, boom, the like, eyes just open up like, oh, I'm in trouble now, right? The donkey, it says, I'm resilient, I'm resourceful, I'm going to be all right. Finally, now his eyes are like, I've got nothing. There's no, uh-oh, what am I going to do now? Now it's panicking in a sense, right? There was no grass, you see. It's amazing to see how, you know, the disobedience of a nation affected so many things and people around it. I mean, it's affecting so many things. I think we often fail to see, guys, how our sin can affect people around us. I think sometimes we think, you know, well, I'm just one person, and, and what I do, not everybody knows. Nobody needs to know. It's going to be okay. It's not going to affect people. But we fail to realize how much our sin can have that collateral kind of damage, right? How it can be widespread and affect other people. Sometimes even just by our, our, our own actions or attitudes that come up through sin and such, and it can be affecting to others. It can be damaging to others. We need to be careful of that, guys. And uh, I think we can underestimate sometimes just that act of sin, thinking, oh, it's, it's maybe done in isolation, nobody knows, and yet it can be very affecting. And these people here were we're walking in this area of disobedience and sin, not realizing that now even the animal kingdom would be affected by it. Pretty serious stuff. So Jeremiah has seen all this, and he now turns to the Lord in verse 7, and he prays. And he says here in verse 7, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do it for your namesake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you, O the hope of Israel, his Savior in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land? And like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night, why should you be like a man astonished, like a mighty one who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in our midst, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. So 
Notice how Jeremiah prays here, right? He, he's not pointing the finger. He's not looking to place the blame on the bad people of the nation. He's not, he's not comparing himself to other people and saying, Lord, okay, I know those guys over there are really guilty. They're really bad. But, Lord, look at me. I'm not like them, all right? Spare me, Lord. No, Jeremiah comes in. And he says, Lord, uh, our iniquities testify against us in verse 7. He's including himself in the mix, though he's walking in obedience, though he's carrying out the will of the Lord as a prophet, he's including himself in the mix, and he's saying, Lord, our iniquities testify against us. Yeah, I understand that. I, I, I think that's great. He's not trying to make excuses. He's not looking to make himself shine at this moment. Jeremiah comes in the way that the, he comes in, in the, way that the whole of the nation should have responded. He comes to the Lord simply saying, we're guilty. I'm guilty, Lord. That's... That's the attitude that the nation should have been having. That's how the nation should have been responding to the Lord. God, we're guilty. And, and as this drought is unfolding, they should have been even quicker to come and realize this is a direct result of our actions. Lord, forgive us. We're guilty. We're repenting. That's what God is desiring all along. That's what repentance is, isn't it? It's acknowledging our guilt and sin and turning from it. That's what God was hoping to produce in these people through this drought that they're experiencing. And so as Jeremiah calls out to the Lord, he asks that, that he forgive and relent not for their sakes, but for his name's sake. You see that? His appeal is based on the Lord's mercy, not on them deserving it, right? He's not trying to make a case saying, Lord, you know what? I mean, yeah, uh, uh, we've done some pretty bad things, but... In comparison to all the other rest of the nations, we're still pretty good, right? We're still kind of the apple of your eye, maybe the core of the apple, at least something, right? I mean, he's not comparing them to other nations and trying to say, those other nations are really wicked. We're just sort of semi-wicked. He's not trying to make a case on them deserving his mercy and his forgiveness. He's saying, Lord, don't do it for us. Do it for your namesake. If Jeremiah prayed, do this according to what we deserve, then you could imagine just, you know, Fire being poured down from heaven, right? Oh, you want me to act according to what you deserve? All right, here it is. Boom, you know, fire from heaven, earthquake, the, the earth just opening up and sucking them in. You know, it's like, okay, there you go. All right, guys, done. Thank you. That was a lot easier than what I had planned, you know? I mean, that's what they would deserve, ultimately. But Jeremiah is wiser than that, and he says, do it for your namesake, Lord. Don't act according to what we deserve, because we know that's not going to be good, but do it for your namesake, God. And remember when God revealed himself to, to Moses and he takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of the rock and, and he passes before and allows Moses to see the, you know, the afterglow of, of the father, the backside of the father as he passes by. And remember, you know, you can just think about Moses thinking, oh, what is this going to be like? What kind of description is Moses going to give of this vision of God? And yet it's the name of the Lord that stands out there. In that scene, Exodus chapter 34, verse 5 to 8, and it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Notice that. Jeremiah saying, Lord, do it for your name's sake, because your name is all about mercy and forgiveness and long-suffering. God, do it for your name's sake. Oh, but, but look at, we didn't finish verse 7 of that verse here. It says, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth gen generation. You see, the Lord is merciful. He's gracious. He's long-suffering. He's forgiving, yes. But he's also a God of justice, you see. And he wouldn't be a good God if he just allowed things to continue on and unravel in sin and in guilt and just kind of dismissed it or let it go. God's a God of justice, and he needs to act upon that justice, and he needs to bring about righteousness in those situations, you see. So Jeremiah reminds God that he's the hope of Israel here. He's their savior in, in time of trouble, you see. He's the one that they're ultimately looking for in, in verse 8 it tells us that now that's what he was to be for them 
That's not what they were encountering or experiencing because of their sin. And the problem was not with God turning his back on them. The problem was with the people turning their back on God. The problem was with the people going their own way and now they're experiencing this difficulty. They're experiencing this this hardship now because of it. And because of it, God's appearing like he's a stranger in the land. He's just a traveler. A traveler, a stranger in the land would not be caring about the land. He wouldn't be putting any stake in the situation around him. He just knows that he's just passing through. So God now is in a sense acting as a a traveler, one who's just passing through. So Jeremiah pleads for the Lord to not uh, appear as a mighty one who's unable to do anything about their situation. Jeremiah is worrying, Lord, you're going to seem like you are a mighty one who's unable to help or unable to save in verse 9. Yet you, O Lord, are, are in our midst, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Now, if the nation would have responded this way that Jeremiah did, then the Lord could have shown forgiveness, right? That's what God was desiring all along. God is seeking to bring about this broken and penitent heart by allowing these things to happen. It tells us in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. The people got so caught up in thinking that if I come and I bring my sacrifices to the temple, if I come and I do all these things in a religious way, then God's going to be favorable towards me. But God's saying, It's not about the things that you do externally. It's about who you are internally. And what God is desiring is that broken heart, that heart of repentance, you see. And Jeremiah is responding that way. And if the nation had followed suit and responded that way in repentance, then God would have loved to have poured out that forgiveness to to display his mercy in this situation. But because of the nation's calloused heart here now, God's going to respond very differently. And we see that here in verse 10. Here we see God giving his reason why he's going to act this way. Look at verse 10. Thus says the Lord to this people. Thus they have loved to wander. They've not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sins. Then the Lord said to me, do not pray for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Rather than answer Jeremiah's plea the way that he was hoping, example, like by providing rain, Lord, you know, bringing food, bringing protection for us, Lord, that's what we're really really hoping for here, God. Rather than responding in, in a positive way, in that way, God says that he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins, right? That's also what, remember what we read in Exodus there when God displayed his name, says, yet I will, I will visit their iniquity. He says, I'm going to remember their iniquity and punish their sins. But wait a second, isn't, isn't God a good and gracious God? Isn't God merciful and kind and good? Where's the forgiveness and the mercy here? Well, understand something here, and, I, and this really comes to the, the crux here of what we want to talk about here tonight too. Because understand something here. As we look at this judgment of God that's coming, and God declaring his judgment he, he's not saying he's giving up on them, but rather what God is doing is essentially declaring his love for them. Well, how so, you ask? God says here that this people, they loved to wander, it tells us, right? These people love to wander, verse 10. They love to go on their own way. They love to follow after other things that was not God or was not of God. They loved to wander. They were wandering in all sorts of trouble, being led away into idolatry. And what happened is they were following in idolatry, worshiping false gods. They were destroying themselves. So understand this here, guys. If God just delivered them without their their heart changing, they would just keep doing it, and they would be eternally lost. If God just says, oh, you know what, guys? It's okay. I forgive you. Or, you know what? I'm just going to take these idols, and I'm just going to bury them over here. That wouldn't fix the problem. Because there's a problem of the heart here, you see. God's desiring a heart change from these people. And so this is where judgment needed to come because it would be through judgment that it would finally and truly wake them up to the reality of what they were doing and the harm that it was bringing. So God, notice, tells Jeremiah to not pray for them. Verse 11 Do not pray for this people, 
for their good. It's the third time in Jeremiah so far that God has told them not to pray for the people. It happened in chapter 7, verse 16, chapter 11, verse 14. Don't pray for these people. Now, you might think, wait a second. That seems so contrary to what it seems we're to be doing. God has given them time after time after time to repent and to be right with him. And he has shown long-suffering and patience. But understand something here, guys. God's patience has its limits. God is not mocked, it tells us in Galatians chapter 6. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. In other words, God must allow these kinds of consequences to come. If not, then God's mocked. There, there's, there's natural consequences for things that we do, right? If we stick our finger in a light socket or put a knife in, a, in an electrical outlet, right? Is something going to happen to us? We're going to get zapped, aren't we? Don't be foolish. Don't be mocked here about this. Don't sit there and say, oh, no, go ahead. You can put that knife right in. It's going to be fine. In the same way, God is not mocked. What you reap, you're going to sow. There's natural outcomes for things that we do. And it's the same way here, you see. If these people are going to walk in disobedience and walk in sin, then they're going to face the, the repercussions of that. See, there comes a point where God's justice must intervene and his judgment is set in motion. And once it starts, it's going to run its course. So God's gotten to the point now with these people where, he's, where he has said, it's time for judgment to come. It's not God's, it's not, God's not sitting here, you know, oh, I just can't wait. He's not sitting here going, three strikes. Oh, strike one, strike two. No, you know what? I'm done anyways. I'm just going to do it now. Forget strike three. God's not itching to pour his judgment, but he realizes judgment needs to come for these people to be shaken up and woken up from this situation that they're in. And that is what is happening with this nation at this time. Because God knew that the only way to truly help them was to see them broken through judgment. Like we read in verse 10, they have loved to wander. They were wandering in all sorts of hurtful things, idolatry and pagan practices that, that was destroying them. So through God's judgment, he would allow them to experience the fullness of what their hearts wanted. How so? He would lead them into Babylon, you see. Babylon, home of idolatry. They would see where this path truly leads through the brutal practices of pagan worship and the harm it brought to them. See, they would face things in Babylon that they have not even had to endure or see before. And they would recognize this is where idolatry leads. If this is where idolatry leads, I don't want anything to do with this. They would experience their babies being taken from them and, and, and brutally murdered in a sense. The psalmist tells us that their babies were, were beaten. They were, they were brutalized. They were, they were just murdered. It's a terrible thing that they had to endure. And the people were there by the river longing for Jerusalem there in Babylon, weeping over the return to Jerusalem. But understand something here, guys. Now, after 70 years in Babylon, they would come back to their land and they would be completely healed. Never again in their entire history would they fall into idolatry. Even today, the Jews abhor idols, you see. They were healed completely, but it took severe judgment for that to be accomplished. That was a purpose that God had. Judgment was not meant to destroy them and wipe them out as a nation. Judgment was meant to ultimately purify them as a nation. And so as they would return from Babylon, they would no longer struggle with idolatry again. Oh, they, they would struggle with other things, granted, but idolatry was not one of them. God had to wipe that from them. God had to take that away from them. And this is why that course of judgment must come. If he didn't, if he relented, if he said, oh, you know what, I, I just love my people too much to do this to them, well, it would allow them to continue on in these things and eventually just simply destroy themselves in that idolatry. God chastens those whom he loves. You parents know the same way with our children. When our children are doing something wrong, we don't just dismiss it and say, oh, I love them too much to punish them. No, it's because we love them. It's because we love you guys that we punish you, all right? I have some punishment reserved for you afterwards, by the way, too, just because I love you. And so it's out of that that we do these things. It's the same way with God. Understand that. So this is why judgment is coming. This is why God is saying, Jeremiah, stop praying. This is why God responds and he says, 
here's what's going to happen, guys. You want this to happen? Well, instead, you're going to get the sword, all right? Verse 13, then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine. Here's, here's Jeremiah speaking to the Lord again. You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Verse 14, and the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesied to you a false vision, a vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say sword and famine shall not be in, the, in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed, and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem. Because of the famine and the sword, they will have no one to bury them. Then nor their wives, their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness on them. So Jeremiah here is pleading with the Lord again, right? This time stating that the people are being led astray by their own prophets. Throughout Jeremiah, we've, seen, uh, we've been seeing how Jeremiah has been prophesying a coming judgment, while these false prophets have also been on the scene prophesying peace, right? So the people are sitting here hearing Judgment is coming. They're also hearing, it's okay, we're going to have peace. Nothing's going to happen to us. So Jeremiah is saying, Lord, understand that this nation, this people are being confused. They're hearing two sides of the story here, basically. But God is saying they need to be understanding and discerning, right? We may have people at times that, that come to us with a word from the Lord and say, you know what? Just feel the Lord wants me to say this to you. And we too have to be discerning of that. How do we test it? How do we know that which is truly the Lord and which is not? Think, put yourself in these guys' shoes here where you're hearing two sides and they're both acting as prophets and you're wondering, well, well which one is right? I, I certainly like this peace word a lot better. That's what I'm going to gravitate to. But you see, it was the word of judgment that was coming that was the right one. That was the one of the Lord. So which one do we gravitate to? Which one do we take? Which one do we accept as right? How do we test these things. How do we test a word from God? Well, first of all, according to the Bible, there would need to be 100% accuracy of that word. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20 and 22 talks about how if a prophet comes and prophesies something and it does not come to pass, it was not of the Lord. And what are you to do to that person? Take him out and stone him, right? Not, not the way that we would think of that today or people in the world would think of that today. It's the biblical stoning. All right. And then secondly, secondly, by lining it up with the word of the Lord. You see, if it is not in line with God's word, then have nothing to do with it. Here's what Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. Deuteronomy chapter 13 also goes on to say, you know, the Lord says if, if a prophet comes and he gives you a word, and he says, let's go and follow after these idols, don't do it. He's testing you. In other words, you know right away when that word contradicts the word of the Lord, then that word is not of the Lord. Very clear, right? It's got to be in line with God's word. When somebody comes and they say, hey, here's what the word or here's what the Lord would say to you. Well, take it, say thank you, and understand, is this going to come to fruition? What's, what's this person's track record like? Have they gone around and been saying a lot of things that don't come true? Secondly, does it line up with God's word? Obviously, if somebody comes up to you and says, the word of the Lord has just told me that we need to go to the bar tonight, and we need to drink a lot of beer and get drunk. Well, you're not going to sit there and go, wow, okay, I, that's, oh, well, if the Lord told me to do it, then okay, let's go do it. You know that's not in line with God's word. And you can look at that person and say, you're a false prophet. Get away from me. Let's go out back. Let's go find some stones, right? You know, um, that's not of the Lord, because it's not in line with the word of the Lord. So these prophets were bringing a false vision. It was something that was, that was made up or, or mistaking their own imaginations for the Lord's will as a false vision. It was also a divination. That was something that was brought about through a demonic inspiration then. It was not from the Lord, you see. Also was described as a... Um, also described as a worthless thing in verse 14. A worthless thing. That could be anything like a, a rumor or a, a foolish tale. Some kind of gossipy sort of a thing, you see. And a deceit. That would be just a purposeful 
misleading. It was something that they were purposefully trying to deceive somebody. So it's seen that these false prophets would come and speak through any one of these four misleadings, you see. So God is giving them some, some warning here. Don't follow in that. And because of it, these false prophets would suffer by the sword and famine. They're, they're saying peace, but they will be the first to be brought down, to be devoured. And they'll have no one to bury their dead bodies. One of the most humiliating things that could happen to a Jew. God says that nobody's going to go and, and bury their bodies there in verse 16. So, verse 17 goes on to say, Therefore you shall say this word to them, Let my eyes flow with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been broken with a mighty stroke, with a, a very severe blow. If I go out to the field, then behold those slain with the sword. And if I enter the city, then behold those sick from famine. Yes, both prophet and priest go about in a land they do not know. Jeremiah, again here, is, seeing, uh, is seen as a weeping prophet. He's, his eyes flowing with tears night and day. He's broken and he's grieved over the plight of this nation, the situation that they're in. And this nation was to be a virgin daughter, a pure people that were set apart for the Lord. But they were defiled. They were not living that way. They were defiled through idolatry. And every place, it says that, that Jeremiah could go, he saw the ravages of judgment. If I go out to the field, those same with the sword are there. And if I enter the city, then behold, those sick from famine are there. They're experiencing all these devastating effects of God's judgment here, wherever he goes. Even the prophets and the priests were affected by this. That's a sad testimony because it was these people, the prophets and the priests, right, that were to be showing the way to the Lord and leading people to the Lord, but these people were also acting in the sin of the nation. They themselves were lost, and they provided little help and hope for the nation. So Jeremiah says in verse 19, have you utterly rejected Judah? Has your soul loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, but there was no good. And for the time of healing, and there was trouble. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not abhor us for your namesake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember, do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the idols of the nations that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord, our God? Therefore, we will wait for you, since you have made all these. So all that is going on. Jeremiah just has to ask, God, are you completely done with us now? Are we, are we finished? Have you rejected us completely now? It seems like they have been written off in the Lord's eyes, or at least that's the, the perception that's being given there. But remember, God's course for judgment will ultimately bring them to a place of full repentance. That's God's reason for judgment was to bring them back to repentance. It says that they've looked for peace in verse 19. Peace was available to them, but how was peace available to them? It was available to them through repentance, through turning from their sin and turning to the Lord. The problem was that they were unwilling to do that. And so these people are experiencing this drought, this famine, this dryness, this barrenness, this coming judgment against them. And Jeremiah pleads again with God based on his name, his throne, and his covenant. Don't say, don't do it for our sake, but do it for your sake, God. This is what he's saying to them. And Jeremiah confesses here that there's no solution, there's no help, there's no hope for Israel apart from God. Verse 23 says, are, are there any among the idols of the nation that can cause rain? And, and that's the sad, that was the, the ironic thing, isn't it? That they would go and serve other idols in hope that they would be provided for when they served the god Baal. Baal was like this, this weather god in a sense. You know, this God that was the one that should provide rain for them so that their crops could grow, so they could be prosperous. So they would worship Baal, thinking he's going to take care of it. But Jeremiah is saying, are there any among the idols of the nations that can cause rain? It's only found in the Lord. Only God can provide what they need. It's the same with us, guys. Only he can provide what we need. And we need to be sure that we are living faithful to him. And like what it says here that we are, are waiting for him, waiting on him. Notice that in, in verse 22. Are you not he, O Lord, our God? Are you not he that can do all these things? So therefore we will wait for you since you have made all these. He is the creator of all these things. He is the provider for all that we need. Let us be those that are waiting for him. If, if, and that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Waiting, right? 
We live in a day where everything is just fast. If we want something, we get it now. We got overnight delivery of what we need. We got, you know, stuff on our phone. We just push a button and it's like, you know, on the computer, you know what it's like, you know, if you have to wait 10 seconds for a web page to load, you're like ready to take a hammer to that computer. We want everything instant now. We don't like waiting. That's a hard thing to do for us. We're conditioned now to have everything instant, you see. But there comes something very sweet as we wait on the Lord, you see. Waiting on the Lord. It's not waiting and doing nothing. It's waiting in the sense that we are just continuing to serve Him. And we're looking to Him to provide all that we need. We so often, when we're in need, we want to make it happen. We want to fix it. We want to, we want to do it ourselves. We don't want to wait. But there's something sweet and wonderful that takes place as we wait for Him and wait on Him because we allow the Lord to do the work His way and His timing, which is always perfect. And we develop great fellowship with the Lord as we wait on Him. That's what is so good about that. Look at what Psalm, verse, uh, Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Lamentations 3 25 to 26, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So waiting can be hard, but it's a sweet thing when it's in the Lord and for the Lord that we're waiting on. It's a significant work that God wants to do in us in that waiting period. So may we be those that wait on him. All right, chapter 14 is down. We're going to hit chapter 15, but youth, you guys can go. If you can answer one question, what book are we studying in? Somebody. Oh, okay, good. All right. All right. Great. Just that was a skill testing question for you. You guys can go, and um, you're going to go have some, some other fun. Oh, thank you. I got it. I'm good. Um, rest of you guys, stand up. Stretch. Lift your hands up in the air. Do something. Get awake, and then we're going to rattle off chapter 15 uh, very quickly. All right, chapter 15. Nobody, nobody left that wasn't supposed to write. Okay, all right, good. All right, nobody sneaking out there. Okay. Look at chapter 15. And it, it, chapter 15 will be a lot quicker because it's, it's only got 21 verses as opposed to 22 verses in chapter 14. So, we'll, man, we'll cruise through this in no time. All right. <laughs> then the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And it shall be if they say to you, where should we go? Then you shall tell them, thus says the Lord, such as are for death to death and such as are for the sword to the sword and such as are for the famine to the famine and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. So Moses and Samuel here, these were two of the great intercessors in Israel's history. Uh, you know, a lot of passages talk about these two and, and there were times where they stood before the Lord and they just interceded for the people and the nation and and God came and answered but God is saying it doesn't matter at this point you know who intercedes for this nation right even if it's Moses and Samuel that, that come back and they're interceding it's not going to stop what I'm about to do it's not going to make any difference again we've already seen his judgment when it is set in motion it's on a course that that won't be stopped in a sense his mind is made up here at this point he may have reached out and visited them in their land to deliver them in the past, as his previous intercessors had done, but now it'll be his people who will be taken out of their land and led away to Babylon. So, and in this judgment, there's four possible scenarios that are given to them. Um, notice that in verse, uh, oh, verse 2 it is. Such as are for death to death and for the sword to the sword. So, first of all, you know, there's going to be those that will die and face death. Most likely many believe it's, you know, talking about a disease that would come and, and, and kind of wipe them out. Or there will be those that die by the sword, it says. Uh, definitely as, as invading armies come in, that's going to be a way that many will, will perish. Some will um, face famine and again will wipe them out. And then if they survive all of these things, then they would be carried off to captivity by the Babylonians. So there's four possible scenarios in this judgment that's given to them. And along with four forms of judgment, there would be four forms of destruction there in verse 3. It says, and I will appoint over them four forms of destruction, says the Lord. The sword to slay, 
the dogs to drag, uh, the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. Now, the first one is speaking of death, all right? The sword is going to come slay them. That's going to kill them. But the last year, you're dealing with that which desecrates them now. It's towards the, those that are dead, they're on the ground. The dogs will drag them away. Birds of the heaven or the beasts of the earth will come and just devour these, these corpses there. Now, Feinberg says this, for a corpse to be dragged on the ground and then become carrion for bird and beast, it was the ultimate desecration of the dead. Uh, it was a very humiliating, awful thing for a Jew to um, encounter that. Not that they would know what's happening at that time, but anyways, for that to happen. And so this word is being done saying, listen, guys, this is what is the, the fate that's awaiting you here again for your, your disobedience and sin. Verse 4. I'll hand them over to the trouble to all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will, have, or who will bemoan you? Or who will turn aside to ask how you are doing? You have forsaken me, says the Lord. You've gone backward. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting. Now, Manasseh, this guy was a very wicked king. All right, Israel had many wicked kings. We know that. Not a great history of good kings there in Israel. But there was something about the evil of Manasseh that stood out greater than all others. It tells us in 2 Kings 21, verse 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. And besides his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Now part of this grievous sin was the sacrifice of children to this idol Molech. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31 talks about that sin, that, that giving away of, of their children, in a sense. A, a horrendous, horrendous sin that was done. But it's amazing that even in all this, we look at Manasseh. He's kind of the poster boy for wicked kings. Yet even with a man like Manasseh, this is amazing here, guys. Because he's taken away into captivity. Um, and yet, we read something amazing about him. It tells us in Second Chronicles 33, verse 12 to 13. Now, when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord as God. And humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. God was still willing to answer the prayers of Manasseh and bring him out of captivity and lead him back to his place in Jerusalem. Amazing. And all it took was what? Manasseh humbling his heart, you see. Humbling himself. Repentance, essentially. That's why repentance is so key. Here we see the most evil of kings now repenting, humbling his heart, and yet the Lord responding to him favorably. So God wasn't bringing his judgment on the people because of Manasseh's sins, but rather because the people continued on in the ways of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh had contributed, no doubt, to the moral decline of the nation, but the nation had imitated his ways. So it's not punishing the people because of what Manasseh did, but it's because the people continued on in the ways of Manasseh. God, again, like we've been saying, had given much time for them to turn from their sin, but rather than going forward in repentance, God says that they've gone backward now. They've gone backward. It was time for God to take action and for this people to see now the ramifications of their actions. So verse 7, And I will winnow them with a winnowing fan in the gates of the land, I will breed them of children. I will destroy my people since they do not return from their ways. Their widows will be increased to me more than the sand of the seas. I will bring against them, against the mother of the young men, a plunderer at noonday. I will cause anguish and terror to fall on them suddenly. She languishes who was born seven. She has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She has been ashamed and confounded, and the remnant of them I will deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. Again, here we see more illustration of the devastation that is coming. A winnowing fan was meant to kind of blow away the chaff, the unwanted part uh, of their crops, you know, and blow it away. Well, now God would be this winnowing fan and would blow them and drive the people away again into um, captivity. And it said, widows will increase to be more than the sand of the sea. Think about that, right? I mean, here's all these women now. As many as the sand on the seas, there's going to be so many widows now because they're going to see their husbands perish now in, in this judgment. And it says a mother of seven 
A mother of seven would be one that was seen as extremely blessed, right? To have a son was important, but to have seven sons was hugely important. And it was a, a picture just being blessed, and, and it would be fortunate for this person to have this number of men to support and help her, right? But even with that kind of protection, what's being said here is that she would even breathe her last. There would be no hope even for the one that was elevated to this place of saying, oh, you are blessed, seven sons. But even that would not be enough to help in this coming situation here. Anyone that had been a remnant, and it means that they had, had survived earlier disaster, well, they would eventually fall by the sword, it tells us. So that's God's response to, to Jeremiah. God laying it out there very clearly, what is coming. Well, here's Jeremiah's response to God now. He says in verse 10, Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. So Jeremiah, look at him, he's kind of pouring out his heart here, right? And he's, he's stating and, and seeing the difficult position that he's in. It, it's like uh, he's saying, I should have never been born at all, right? Oh, woe is me, my mother. You should never have had me. This has not been good for me. Yes, he's been a man of contention for having to speak the truth, right? He's simply being faithful to what God is calling him to speak, and yet he's seeing nothing but opposition and people coming against him. It's not been easy. Remember in chapter, um, well, I think it was in chapter uh, 13, um, chapter 12 or 13, where, you know, Jeremiah was just ready to give up, right? And, and God's saying, if you have become weary with the footman, how are you going to strive with the, with the horseman? How are you going to continue on when things even get more difficult and perhaps now this is the place that jeremiah is in you know as things are heating up right but remember here he is saying i should never have been born at all but remember guys chapter one it was from the very womb of his mother that he was called right i mean god knew exactly what jeremiah would do what he would accomplish what he would go through none of this would be a surprise to the lord and the lord's calling him and calling him simply to be faithful now I can certainly feel his pain. I'm sure many of us can, having to go through what he's had to go through. Could you imagine having to stand up and speak of this constant impending judgment and death that was coming upon this nation? I mean, could you imagine if I had to do that at this church every Wednesday night, every Sunday, just get up and say, you guys, you are a bunch of idiots. God is going to come against you. You're going to be wiped out. You're going to have everything taken from you, everything destroyed. And if I said that every Wednesday after every Sunday, I mean, it, it wouldn't be too long until I'm just, you know, talking to myself. I'd be putting a mirror on the front row that I have some audience there, right? I, it, it would empty out the church. I mean, nobody would want to hear that. It would be a very difficult message to have to give over and over again, right? That would be a hard thing to do here. But first of all, um, it would be a hard thing, but... You see, God has called us to simply speak the truth, right? It's not always going to make us popular. And Jeremiah is experiencing that right now. He's not a very popular people, uh, person among his peers here. But God hasn't called us to be popular. He's called us to be faithful and to represent him. And today, thankfully, our message is not about, you know, necessarily impending judgment. But our, our message is being able to emphasize the death of Jesus Christ, who stepped in for us, sacrificed himself, and bore the judgment of God in our place. I mean, that's the truth that we get to share with people today, you know, and, and, and lay out for them. And even then, that's not a popular message to give. That's not always going to make us popular when we stand up for Christ, when we begin to talk about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the fact that God poured out his judgment upon his son to spare us so that we could be saved and brought into life in him that's not always a popular topic and a subject to share but nevertheless <laughs> it's a lot better than sharing what jeremiah had to share here but the key is that god's simply calling us to be faithful and to speak that truth that he has given us here notice verse 11 the lord said surely it'll be well with your remnant surely i will cause the enemy to intercede with you in the time of adversity and in the time of affliction you know, the Lord doesn't release Jeremiah from his calling. Notice that, right? But what does he do? He rather comforts him in the midst of it. God's showing him that it'll be okay. 
And the remnant of those that will remain true to God will be taken care of. It'll be well with your remnant. Even in a time of distress, God will have his enemies come to him and intercede with him. They'll, they'll come to Jeremiah. They're going to intercede with Jeremiah. Even his enemies, God, you see, is having his hand upon Jeremiah. Even in times of affliction, God will show himself faithful. And Jeremiah will experience favor with others. Verse 12, can anyone break iron? The northern iron and the bronze, your wealth and your treasures, I will give as plunder without price because of all your sins throughout your territories. And I will make you cross over with your enemies into a land which you do not know, for a fire is kindled in my anger which shall burn upon you. So iron was that metal that was kind of indestructible. It was a strong metal. It's the way that Babylon is being likened to. They're going to come in with great strength and they're going to have their way and leave Judah off in a captivity here. And remember, it's an act of God, right? Notice what, what we read there. It says, I will give us plunder. I will make you cross over. Babylon may think that they're in control and that they're orchestrating all this, but understand that God is the mastermind behind this, that God is the one in charge and in control and leading all these things. And God is sending them there just as he can also and will deliver them in due time. God is the one that's got his hand upon these people, not the Babylonians. Verse 15, O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake I've suffered rebuke. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because of your hand. For you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream as waters that fail? So on one side, Jeremiah felt the difficulties of people against him, and he cries out to the Lord for help here. And as he asks the Lord to remember him, he also takes time to remember the word, right? So he's in distress over these things. He's calling out to the Lord, but then he's also remembering the sweetness of the word of God. You see, for years the law was lost, all right? The very word of God, they, had, they, they didn't have it. And it was during that time, during Josiah's, King Josiah's reforms, that a copy of God's word was discovered. The law was found once again, possibly even by Jeremiah's father. The story is in 2 Kings chapter 22. And so Jeremiah began to have a real appetite for the word of God, it says here, right? I ate them. I, the, your words were found, and I ate them. I love that. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Uh, it was a similar experience to what Job encountered with in, Jer in Job chapter 23. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And Job encountered great trouble, great distress. Yet he understood that the word of the Lord would not depart from him because he's treasured these things far greater than anything else. How about us? Have we treasured the word of the Lord? Have we cherished the word of the Lord? Just like Jeremiah who would eat the word of God. Do we take it in as though it's food to nourish us? Oh, we love to sit down for a good meal, don't we? Right? You get to a nice restaurant sometimes, and you sit down, you, you bite into a nice steak, and it's like, oh, man, your mouth is just, you're just drooling. It's so good, right? Listen, the word of God is far greater, far better, you know? Do we sit there and take in the word of God and be like, oh, man, this is just so good. Oh, I can't contain myself. This is so good. Do we have a hunger for the word of the Lord? Like what these men had here. That's what I pray. It is something that we are, are gaining more and more every day as we get into the word of God and see how wonderful it is. See how it feeds us and how it strengthens us. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You see, it's having an effect in us. It's feeding us. It's nourishing us. It's causing us to grow in the things of the Lord. May we devour the word of God like we devour our dinner, right? May we just take in the word of God and, and chew on it and allow it to nourish us. That's so important. Jeremiah is, is stating here how he took in that word and it was just sweet to him. 
and it brought great joy, you know. I, I love that. It, it provides that joy and rejoicing in the heart, you know. And here's Jeremiah, I think, and he's, and he's remembering these things because it's in this time right now where he's in, he's in great distress. I mean, he's kind of pouring out his heart to the Lord, right? Man, everybody's against me. I shouldn't have been born at all. I mean, this has been tough. This has been hard. Ah, oh, but you know what? And I remember your word and how faithful your word is and how good your word is and how it, how it fed me, how I ate it up. And it was the joy and rejoicing of my heart. See, in all of the complaint that Jeremiah's doing, it was as he reflected on the word that he was reminded again, even that he was called by his name, right? It brought him again to that awareness that, Lord, you called me in this. This is not by chance. This is not some, you know, silly mistake I made thinking that I'd be some prophet. I mean, that was, that was a crazy career choice there. No, he's saying it was by your name that I was called here. Though trouble was brewing, he served a big God who would enable and help him. And that's what time in the word does, doesn't it? It brings us back to the heart of God and gives us a right perspective on what we're dealing with. Even in the midst of trial and hardship, it brings us back to the heart of God and it brings that joy and rejoicing of our heart out again as we feed upon the word. May we be doing that. Verse 19, therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me. If you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified bronze wall, and they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. So as Jeremiah pours out his heart to the Lord, God simply says, if you return, then I will bring you back. In other words, though you're facing opposition, if you can see the good even in these hard times, that's what was being meant there by uh, uh, take out the precious from the vial. Jeremiah, if you can just see in the midst of even this opposition and, and hardship and difficulty you're in, if you can just draw out the good from the bad within this here, then you'll see that I'll be your strength in this. You, you'll get past this. You'll, you'll see that I'm going to make you a, a fortified bronze wall in a sense. They will fight against you, but they're not going to prevail. Why? Because I'm for you, Jeremiah. I'm with you. And I will save you and deliver you, says the Lord. This is what God is saying to Jeremiah. What comforting words those are. I'm with you to save you and deliver you. That's exactly what we have in and through Jesus Christ. Because he has delivered us from that which we've needed delivering from the most, and that is sin. We have been delivered. We have been saved through Jesus Christ. And he's already redeemed us from the grip of the terrible. What a precious Savior we serve, guys. Jeremiah came to see all this through pouring out his heart to God. God didn't condemn him, but he comforted him. Man, when you're going through hardship, when you're going through trial, difficulty, when you're facing opposition and you're wondering, why? Why is this happening? I shouldn't have been born at all. Pour out your heart to God, people. Sometimes we think, oh no, God's going to, if I pour out my heart to God, then God's not going to be too happy with me because there's, man, I've got a lot of questions and I've got a lot of trouble going on in me. No, pour that out to the Lord. Because what God wants to do is reveal himself and bring comfort to you in those times. Not condemn you. Jeremiah wasn't condemned, though he's being very honest with the Lord. But that's what God desires, is for us to be honest with him and pour out our heart before him. And it's in those times as we go to the Lord that we can receive his counsel, that we can receive that comfort, that we can be reminded of what God has done for us. As Jeremiah has been reminded that God will make him a fortified bronze wall. That's what God told him in the beginning in chapter 1. Well, God's having to remind him again. Jeremiah, did you forget what I said? Did you forget what I told you? That I'm going to take care of you in this? Let me tell you again, Jeremiah. Don't be troubled. Be at peace, be comforted right now. That's what God desires to do in our lives. Now, when you're going through difficulty, trial, pour your heart out to the Lord. Be honest with Him. But allow Him to speak to you and comfort you. Take the Word of God in and let it be the joy and rejoicing of your heart as you get that right perspective again of who God is and His heart for you. Amen? All right. Hey, that's it. Chapter 15 down. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you here tonight, and as we look upon this word in Jeremiah, there are um, a lot of things, God, that we can take out of this here tonight. Lord, as Jeremiah began, and 
just looking at the drought that was hitting the land. Lord, I pray that if there are those here today that are going through dryness, barrenness, maybe just feeling desolate, Lord, may they look to you. God, may they not blame that which has gone around them, but look to their own heart and say, God, I, I've gotten away from you. And Lord, thank you for that call to repent, that invitation to come and return to you, Lord. And may we do that, Lord, and may we experience that living water flowing out of our heart once more. Would you feed us, God? Would you strengthen us? Even as Jeremiah, in, in his time of trouble, as he poured out his heart to you, Lord, and is reminded of your goodness, your faithfulness, and those comforting words you had, Lord, let those speak loudly to us here tonight. Thank you, God, for saving us and delivering us. Thank you for redeeming us, Lord, from the grip of the terrible, from all that we could have fallen prey to, Lord. We have life, hope, help in you. And so we thank you and praise you for that, Jesus. Help us to be those that are feeding on the word of God and allowing it to nourish us and strengthen us. Would you go with us here tonight now and the remainder of this week, Lord, and may we just bring glory and honor to your name in all that we do. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.